please join me for the call to worship. We have traveled to this holy place to worship God together. We have come longing for a glimpse of God, or a glimpse of the world the way God sees it. Through our worship, music, learning, and laughter, may God focus our sight through the lens of God's love. Let us worship God, the King of kings, the Lord Most High. The Christian year is approaching its end. Advent is just around the corner, a new beginning, a fresh start. Out of the old and in with the new. Christ is coming anew. How many times must we go through this cycle before realizing we cannot go our way? God's way is the only way. King of kings, host of hosts, we close this Christian year reminded that you are above all. You rule and the whole world is your kingdom. Today we turn our thoughts to Jeremiah, a young man who doubted his ability to undertake the task you called him to do. As we start a new year, a new cycle, a new line of thinking, hear us as we confess our failings to you. Let us pray. We ask that you forgive us for the times that we have run from your call. Sometimes we simply doubt the gifts you have given us. We forget that you know us and we, we are capable in more ways than we ever will. It is overwhelming 
It is frightening at times. Loving God, may our hearts be made worthy to be your prophets. May we go where you call us to go and speak the word that you give us. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, may your words be on our lips. May your grace dwell in our hearts so that we might pluck up and pull down, destroy and overthrow, build and plant as you command. Amen. God has loved us since the beginning, and God's love for us will never end. Do not fear, therefore, but have faith in God's steadfast love, God's healing power, and God's ability to make all things new. In Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. You may be seated, and I'd like to invite the children to come forward for this morning's baptism. Good morning. I'm glad to see all of you. I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving and ready to move into the Advent Christmas season now. Uh, this morning we have an exciting opportunity together to celebrate another baptism of a, a new member of our church. So as she and her family come forward, I'd like to ask you to help me welcome this baby with singing Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me. This beautiful little girl is Amara. Everybody say, hey, Amara. Hey, Amara. All right. Amara has a big sister, Kiara, who many of you already know from her involvement in the church. It is a delight for us to welcome her, and she's going to look to you all to find out what it means to be a part of this church and a part of Christ's family. So you're going to be really important in her life. Let me introduce her to everybody else, and I'll be back. We're delighted to welcome a lot of family members who are here to celebrate Thanksgiving holidays with family, but I bet no one came further than Gabby's family who came from Peru today. We're delighted to have you all and, and everybody who came especially for this occasion. On this day, we celebrate a covenant, the covenant that God has made with us through Jesus Christ covenant that God will never leave us or forsake us and will always love us and be a part of our lives and be accepting of us. We celebrate that Christ gave his life for us in that covenant love and offered to forgive our sins and grant us everlasting life. We celebrate the opportunity to be invited into fellowship with Jesus Christ and to be a part of Christ's family through adoption 
And in baptism, we celebrate that adoption. So as we recognize God's covenant love for us, we also make covenants today. Omara's parents are going to be making promises, covenant promises, that they intend to bring her up in a Christian family and home. They plan to have her in church where she can learn about Jesus and also teach her about her, him at home. And they look to you all and all of us in the church as part of their family as well and part of those who will nurture and teach her about Jesus Christ, love her, make her a part of our family. So this morning, we all make promises that we will be her family and we will support Michael and Gabby and their bringing up of this child and all the children of our church. So this morning, we celebrate the love of God through Jesus Christ for us, the opportunity that we have to be a part of Christ's family, and the new addition of this child into our particular church family and the whole Christian family where she is accepted as a part of her parents' love for Christ for now until she is old enough to make promises on her own as far as being a follower of Jesus Christ. But today we rejoice and give thanks for this child and for Christ's love for her and for all of us. Michael and Gabby, as you present your child for Christian baptism this morning, I would ask you to respond to these questions. Do you reaffirm your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Do you? I do. Do you claim God's covenant promises on Amara's behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for her salvation as you do for your own? Do you? Do you now promise in humble reliance upon God's grace to set before Amara an example of the new life in Christ? Do you? I do. Do you promise to pray with and for Amara and to bring her up in the knowledge and love of God? Do you? I do. Asking questions of the congregation this morning is Elder Mary Ann Reno. Do we, the members of this congregation, in the name of the whole Church of Christ, undertake with these parents the Christian nurture of this child, so that in due time she may confess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Do we? Amen. Will we endeavor by our example and fellowship to strengthen Amara's ties with the household of God? Will we? And boys and girls, as part of this church family, will you do everything you can to help Amara feel like a member of this church and our family and learn what it means to be a Christian child in this church? If you will, please put your hand up today. Excellent. Thank you very much. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the gift of this child. We thank you for her family, for her extended family, for our church family. We ask your blessing upon all the promises that we have made today in response to your great promises to us. We ask that you'll help us to be faithful to them. We ask now that you'll set aside this common element of water to fulfill a sacred purpose by symbolizing for us the cleansing love of Jesus Christ through the waters of baptism for Amara and for all of us. In Christ's name, amen. What's your child's full name? Amara Aida Pesquera Hearn, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for Amara, and we pray that she'll never know a time in this life when she's not aware of your presence and your love for her. Be with Michael, with Gabby, with Kiara as they care for her and teach her, raise her as you would have them raise her. We ask that you'll help her to grow in, in every way in accordance with your purpose every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Boys and girls, if you're going to Children's Church, you can go. I'm going wherever Amara's going, apparently. <laughs> uh, invite everyone to sign the book, baptismal book, as witnesses to this baptism on your way out of church today. 
And we'll remain seated as we sing the baptismal hymn number 488. Please join me for the prayer for illumination. Holy Spirit, as the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in his time, bring this word now to us. Touch our mouths and our hearts with your word today, that we may build on it in our lives, in the church, and in your world. Amen. The Old Testament reading this morning is from Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. It can be found on page 698 in your Pew Bible. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched his mouth, and the Lord said to me, now I have put these words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The second reading is also from Jeremiah, chapter 7, verses 1 through 11. We move from the call of Jeremiah to be a prophet to one of the biggest and most difficult days of his career as a prophet. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, the temple, and proclaim there this word and say, 
Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah, you that enter these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and let me dwell with you in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. For if you truly amend your ways and your doings, if you truly act justly with one another, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, and the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own hurt, then I will dwell with you in this place, in the land that I gave of old to your ancestors forever and ever. Here you are, trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we're safe, only to go on doing all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? You know, I too am watching, says the Lord. May God bless the reading and the hearing and the understanding of the scriptures that have been read today. Today is celebrated as Christ the King Sunday, the last Sunday of one church year before we begin a new one with the season of Advent next week. Our text today is not about Jesus, though, but it does point us to why it was so necessary that Jesus come and become our King of Kings and Lord of Lords, our Savior. Because Jeremiah tells of a time when things fell apart for Jerusalem and the people of God and helps us make sense of those times when things fall apart for us. The job of being a prophet was not one Jeremiah wanted. In the passage Henry read, God called Jeremiah to be a prophet, and Jeremiah immediately protested, Oh, whoa, not me, I'm too young. I don't know how to talk to people. God said that was nonsense and assured him that he would provide all the words that Jeremiah would need to blow up kingdoms and to plant kingdoms. It was not going to be an easy calling. <clears throat> Jeremiah was a prophet in the city of Jerusalem about 600 years before Jesus was born. He was a contemporary of Isaiah, who you heard about yet last Sunday. He lived during a tumultuous period of history. The northern kingdom of Israel, just to their north, had fallen to Assyria, about a hundred years earlier. And the Assyrians had threatened the southern kingdom of Judah as well. <coughs> and in last week's story, Isaiah had counseled his king, the king of Judah, Hezekiah, not to pay the bribery that the king of Assyria was requiring for safety, but to trust in the Lord alone for security. Hezekiah did that. And Jerusalem was miraculously spared defeat at that time. And that was a good thing. But it also reinforced the belief that God would never allow anything bad to happen to Jerusalem itself. So things in Judah continued to spiral downwards in their relationship with God. And it continues to be Jeremiah's job to proclaim that the end has come. And no one likes sharing that kind of news. Jeremiah faithfully obeyed that calling. He proclaimed gloom and doom. He constantly criticized his king and his nation and his neighbors for everything. And re as a result, he was despised. He was called a traitor. He was thrown into prison. If you look today in, Jeremiah, in uh, Webster's Dictionary under Jeremiah, it does define Jeremiah as a Hebrew prophet, 
But it also defines Jeremiah as any person who is pessimistic about the present and foresees a calamitous future. You know any Jeremiah's? And it gets worse in, in Webster's. His very name has been co-opted into a word. A Jeremiah is defined as a prolonged lamentation or complaint or a cautionary or angry harangue. Prolonged lamentations and angry harangues, these were what Jeremiah was known for in his prophetic ministry. The newly developing power on the world scene during Jeremiah's day was the Babylonian Empire. Jeremiah prophesied in the capital city of Jerusalem up until its defeat by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. and the beginning of the period of exile in Babylon. Jeremiah told the people that God could not understand how they could have failed to learn anything from the experience of their neighbors in the north, the kingdom of Israel, which had been defeated and carried into exile by the Assyrians. They continued to do the same old things. They continued to oppress the poor and not take care of widows and orphans. They continued to trust the same false gods, oblivious seemingly to the fact that without turning to God and trusting in God alone, their destruction was imminent. He told them God wanted them to trust him alone rather than any kind of weapons or alliances with other countries or idols of wood or silver or gold. The temple, which stood in the middle of Jerusalem, <coughs> created a special problem for getting through to the people of Jerusalem because they viewed the temple as God's home, that God actually lived there, it was his dwelling place, and they were firmly convinced that because of that, God would never allow anything to happen to Jerusalem. So as long as they kept going to the temple for Sabbath observances and participating in the sacrifices required, everything was going to be okay. So in the other passage for today, Jeremiah went to that temple and stood in the gate, and as people arrived, he told them all that if they thought just coming there one day a week was going to make up for all the horrible things they were doing the other six days, they were out of their minds. He stood there and criticized the king. <clears throat> he criticized other prophets who were saying, well, everything's going to be okay. Criticized the priests who were taking advantage of their positions. Criticized the people for their role in all of it. Well, can you imagine how we would feel if someone was standing out in the yard in front of our church as we arrived on Sunday morning? shouting at us and yelling about our hypocrisy and our evil deeds. One day Jeremiah was so angry about some people participating in a human sacrifice that he took a clay pot and held it up and he said, this is what God's going to do to you, and he smashed it to smithereens. Well, in 597 B.C., the Babylonian army came and they carried off some exiles to Babylon but they spared the city of Jerusalem at that point. They spared the temple and they left many residents. And that reinforced the belief that Jerusalem was never going to fall. But Jeremiah continued to say, no, the end is coming. Another prophet said, don't worry, the exiles are going to be back and everything will be just like normal within two years. In response, Jeremiah wrote a letter to the exiles and said, build homes, plant gardens, get married, have children, work for the welfare of Babylon because you're going to be there a long time. Jeremiah was not taken to Babylon with that first wave of exiles, so he continued to warn the people and the rulers of the need to return to God, but to no avail. Finally, the armies of Babylon returned 10 years later. They surrounded Jerusalem and cut off supplies. An army from Egypt approached from the south to try to assist in the defense of Jerusalem as they had done before. At that time, Jeremiah went to the king and advised him to surrender, to accept exile in Babylon. 
king didn't accept that news. He had Jeremiah imprisoned for this treasonous advice and for the negative effect he always had on people. The Babylonians began their siege of Jerusalem while Jeremiah was in prison. While the siege was going on, Jeremiah's cousin, Hannibal, came to him with an absurd request. He came with the offer that Jeremiah could buy his land in Anathoth under the right of redemption law, which said that if a family was in danger of losing their land because of financial difficulties, it was the obligation of the oldest male member of the family to buy that property so it wouldn't be lost from the family. This land in Anathoth would have lain beyond the northeast wall of the city of Jerusalem was certainly already occupied by the Babylonian army. So here Jeremiah is in prison. The city's under siege. The chances of Jeremiah ever being able to use that land are slim and none. One would expect one of Jeremiah's harangues at this point about it being a little too late to redeem land. But to our astonishment, Jeremiah agrees to this purchase and says the Lord has told him to do this as a sign. So Jeremiah makes arrangements to get the money together. He makes a big deal out of the preparation and preservation of the deed. He has his scribe Baruch put the deed in a clay pot and put it somewhere as safe as possible. And Jeremiah concludes by saying the Lord says that Houses and fields and vineyards will again be bought in this land. Judgment is the first word in this story, but it's not the last word. It's not going to last forever. Not too many weeks go by when I don't sit with someone for whom the armies of Babylon have figuratively hemmed them in and are ready to move in for the kill. They may have been in denial about it happening, but they finally come up against the stark realization that it is indeed going to happen. They are going to lose their job. Their spouse is filing for divorce. The cancer is back. A child is rebelling. The end of something is at hand. And in place of denials or struggles or excuses or false hopes, there is the beginning of grief. And there's also a temptation to despair. And sitting in my seat, the temp temptation is so great to want to hold out some sort of false hope for people sitting in that difficult place, to want to fix it for them, to want to assure them, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. But there's no integrity in that. It encourages wishful thinking rather than hope. The truth is that endings happen, and they are enormously painful. And things are never the same afterward. You have to trust for the long haul. You have to build a home and plant a garden in a place you don't want to be. You have to let other people or forces control your life for a period of time while you learn some difficult lessons. But you have to have a hope that God is still with you, still loves you, still cares about you, and will still be at work in your life and has a future for you. If I didn't have faith in such a God, I'm sure I would have changed jobs many years ago rather than continuing to sit down with people moving into situations of exile time, time after time after time. <clears throat> Stories from the Bible like Jeremiah's helped prepare me and sustain me. And stories like Joseph being sold into slavery by his brothers, but later telling them that while they meant to harm him, God meant it for good so that many people would be saved from famine. Stories like Naomi being blessed by her Moabite daughter-in-law, Ruth, after the death of her husband and both sons. These stories and many more from both Testaments help me understand how hope does not disappoint us. Watching the people I sit with move over time from despair to hope, 
<coughs> from exile to home, from bitterness to joy. That's what keeps me going and helps me know it's possible. It's important to note that the words of Jeremiah, which were so disliked and rejected by his people during his lifetime, came later to have such importance for the Jewish people in hindsight that they were preserved and included in Scripture. Not just some pithy little sayings, but all 52 chapters, including many angry harangues. In fact, Jeremiah probably deserves a lot of credit for helping the Jews survive the exile with his words of warning and hope and encouragement to settle in for a long haul while knowing that one day a different future would come. So Jeremiah is a good book for when we go through experiences of exile, when we get beyond asking, why is this happening to me? Why is God allowing this to happen? It is worth considering the possibility that God wants us to accept our circumstances for the time being and do what we can with it. What difference would it make for us to shift from self-pity and anger at God to asking the question, is God maybe calling me to be patient and bloom where I am planted until further instruction? There's no question that Israel's faith matured greatly as a result of the exile, but no one would choose such a painful way to grow. It takes a lot of patience and courage to learn to bloom where you're planted when where you're planted is not at all where you want to be. It is telling that Jeremiah, this most negative of all the prophets, also has perhaps the most quoted verse from the Bible of a most hopeful nature when he said, Surely I know the plans I have for you, the Lord says plans which are for your welfare, not for harm, plans to give you a future with hope. God's plan for peace for us has lots of twists and turns and bumps, frequently because of our mistakes and unfaithfulness, but its destination is certain. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. As we respond to God in our own lives, I invite you to begin by standing and joining me in our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed, which is found in the front of your hymn book at the top of page 35 if you're not familiar with it. Together, let us say what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. Do not. 
Please join me in prayer. To God, we are thankful to you for this day, for your presence in it, for your calling us together to be your people in this place, and for the variety of experiences we have had in your house this day. We ask that you'll help us to learn from the teachings of Jeremiah and the experiences of Judah that it is not enough just to come here on Sunday, that it is an important act and it is a, an energizing and recharging act to come and be recalled to relationship to you. But the, the proof <coughs> comes when we leave this place and use the other six days of our lives to serve you to care for the least among us, to work for peace and justice in the world. We ask that you'll fill us with your spirit and with a determination to live in this manner every day of our lives. We offer our prayers this day for those who are struggling, for those who are sick, for those who are imprisoned, for those in hospitals and nursing homes, for those who are caring for loved ones in difficult circumstances, for those who are undergoing trials and difficulties, for those who experience absence of loved ones during the holidays. Pray your comforting strength and peace for each one. Pray that you'll give us courage to persevere through exile periods in our lives, keeping our eye on you, upon Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith as we run the race that's set before us. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. We ask that you'll accept our humble gratitude and determination to live for him and to allow, allow him to be the king of our lives and the saviors of our lives. Fill us with your peace, we pray. Fill the whole creation with your peace and with your justice and with your hope. And we pray all of these things in the name of Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us continue to worship God as stewards of what we have been given, presenting God's tithes and our offering to the Lord.
God, as we come to the close of this Thanksgiving weekend, we do wish for you to know how very grateful we are for all of our blessings of every type. We ask that you'll accept these gifts from our hands as expressions of our stewardship of our whole lives to you, and ask that you'll help us to be faithful in that stewardship each day and each moment. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.